Despite what Time magazine would have us believe, there is no doubt that the most influential newsmaker of the year has been Edward Snowden, a former CIA employee and NSA subcontractor who at the age of 29 became the unlikely center of global attention with his release of documents allegedly detailing the inner workings of various NSA spying programs. Of the many intriguing aspects of this story, by far one of the most frustrating is that, other than a few interviews and press conferences, almost everything we know about Snowden, his motivations, and the documents themselves come from intermediaries who have found themselves in the position of spokespeople on the case. Even such basic questions as how many documents Snowden leaked is still unclear, with various sources listing anything from 10,000 to 1.7 million documents. If details as basic as these vary so widely between sources, how much more opaque are the more difficult questions of Snowden's motivations and intentions, let alone the specifics of any deals he may have made with journalists about how this data was to be disseminated? Questions about the practices of the journalists that Snowden has partnered with arose from the moment that the story broke. According to Washington Post reporter Barton Gelman's own account, he was the first to be contacted with Snowden's information. One of Snowden's conditions for working with Gelman was that the Post agreed to publish the full text of the PRISM program presentation, a total of 42 slides, within 72 hours, along with a cryptographic key that Snowden could use to prove to foreign embassies that he was the source of the information. According to Gelman, when he could not promise to meet that demand, Snowden turned to Greenwald and The Guardian. Although several conflicting accounts of Snowden's early efforts to reach out to reporters have since been forwarded, it is interesting to note that The Guardian did not meet these demands either, publishing only four of the 41 PRISM slides. It wasn't until October of this year that Le Monde published several more slides from the presentation, but to this day the full presentation has still not been released to the public, apparently in contradiction to Gelman's account of Snowden's intentions. In fact, similar questions surround the ongoing release of Snowden's documents. Who is deciding what documents to release and what documents to redact? Is there a time frame for the release of specific pieces of information? And if so, is this schedule being kept? Did Snowden himself have demands in regards to the release of these documents? Or, after demanding a certain time frame and method for release of the prison documents and finding that none of his journalist contacts would fulfill that agreement, did he merely hand over his entire document cache to them to release as they see fit? Again, we only have the word of the journalists themselves to answer these questions, meaning that we have no definitive answer at all. However, revelations continue to emerge about what is and what is not being published by the media partners who have acquired possession of these documents. We continue to publish stuff, but it's about 1% of what we were given. As far as I can see, uh, you've had 58,000 files, so you're telling this committee that only 1% of the information in those files has now gone public. Yes. After six months of reporting on the story, The Guardian has so far only published 1% of the files in its possession. According to a rough estimate published on Cryptome.org in November of this year, out of a reported 50,000 pages, or files, not clear which, about 514 pages, 1%, have been released over five months beginning June 5, 2013. At this rate, 100 pages per month, it will take 42 years for full release. Snowden will be 72 years old. His reporters, hoarding secrets, all dead. Is this really what Snowden, or even the journalists themselves, intended to happen with this treasure trove of information? Can the glacial pace at which the documents are being released be justified by the state of disorganization or confusion that the massive data dump has caused for the story's reporters? Not according to Glenn Greenwald. Back in June, shortly after the initial reporting on the Snowden story and the prison program, Greenwald told BuzzFeed that the documents had been beautifully organized, almost to a scary degree. He then went on to imply that his reporting on the story would be over in a matter of months, telling journalist Jessica Testa, If I'm still working on these stories a year from now, I'll probably be in an asylum somewhere. So what changed? Why are we now six months into the Snowden story and the public has still only seen 1% of the documents in question, or less depending on how many documents there actually are? Has something come along in the meantime to persuade the crusading journalists who are so fearlessly reporting on this story to slow down and draw out their reporting? In mid-July of this year, just weeks after telling BuzzFeed that he was planning to finish his reporting on Snowden within the year, it was announced that he had signed a book deal with Metropolitan Books, a subsidiary of Henry Holt & Co., for an undisclosed sum. Although Greenwald's defenders bristle at the suggestion that the journalist is holding back documents from the public so he can sell them to the publisher, this aspect of the book deal is not even controversial. At the time of the announcement, 
Metropolitan Books promised that it would contain new revelations exposing the extraordinary cooperation of private industry with the U.S. intelligence community. In a recent Reuters article, Greenwald was even more specific. The book is about my time with Snowden in Hong Kong and reporting the story, but mostly about the surveillance state based on the documents I have that The Guardian doesn't, and my reasons why the surveillance state is menacing, he said in the Reuters piece. A bidding war is now taking place for the movie rights to the book, with the New York Times reporting that 20th Century Fox, Sony Pictures Entertainment, and HBO are all bidding on the project, although Greenwald assures Reuters that no deal has been struck yet. But for those who are concerned about the fact that Greenwald is hoarding documents in order to entice publishers and movie producers to bid up his projects, more concerning still are details of the new journalism venture that he is entering into with billionaire eBay magnate Pierre Omidyar. Glenn Greenwald has been a lightning rod for controversy since he obtained those secret NSA documents from Ed Snowden and published some of them in The Guardian. Now he's launching a media company backed by wealthy eBay founder Pierre Omidyar and running into harsh criticism from those who believe he is unfairly profiting from his access to Snowden. (laughs) Alan Rusbridger said um, they've perhaps released 1% of the information that Snowden got. Will you be releasing more of that? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, just to answer your initial question, um, you know, Pierre, Laura, Glenn, and I started having a series of conversations, communications uh, several months ago. Uh, Glenn and Laura and I were already talking about creating some kind of a, of a news site that we were going to use, not necessarily to replace what we do in our normal journalistic lives, but an additional outlet. And we were going to do a Kickstarter campaign, basically beg for money, and maybe try to hire one or two young journalists who would work with us on it. And at that sort of moment, I was in Rio discussing this with Glenn, and um, and and then we get this email uh, from a mutual friend of Glenn's and uh, Pierre's, basically saying that Pierre, you know, is, is is working on starting this new news organization and wants to talk to you about possibly contributing, uh, and that sort of kicked off this process. Then, where it was clear that Pierre's goal with this, which was to build an, a news organization that would have a an inherently adversarial posture toward the state and those in power, um, was in line with what we wanted to do. And um, you know, I, I in a million years, if you had told me a year ago, oh, you'll be working on a project with the founder of eBay, I would have, I, I think. I would have laughed because it 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 it, it wouldn't it would it would be sort of antithetical to everything I think would happen. But the question is again raised: If Greenwald has continued to hold back documents from the Guardian and other outlets for his own personal use, did he use the allure of those documents as bait to attract Omidyar's investment? Is he, in fact, selling Snowden's leaked documents to a billionaire? At this point, we have only speculation to go on. Very few details of Greenwald's agreement with Omidyar have been so far presented to the public, and unless some insider is to come forward with a leak, speculation of the specifics of their business partnership remain in the realm of speculation. But we do know that at the end of September, Greenwald and Scahill revealed that they were working on a groundbreaking story containing new details on the NSA's role in the U.S. assassination program gleaned from Greenwald's private stash of Snowden documents. Well, teaming up to take down the NSA, journalists Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill have announced that they are working together to prepare a report on the National Security Agency's role in the so-called U.S. assassination program. Speaking to moviegoers at the Rio Film Festival in Brazil, Scahill announced the partnership and provided some details on the new project. However, neither Scahill nor Greenwald provided any evidence to support claims of the existence of the assassination programs or the NSA's role in it. So far, anyway. Two weeks later, the $250 million deal with Omidyar was announced and talk of the assassination program expose stopped. Three months later, no further details have been released about the story, and whether or not it will appear as one of the first big ventures on Omidyar's new news venture. More worrying still is Pierre Omidyar's role in this saga. That this billionaire co-founder of eBay is suddenly so concerned with the state of journalism that he is willing to drop a quarter of a billion dollars purchasing the services of the very man who is sitting on a trove of tens of thousands, or more, NSA documents is odd, especially considering that Omidyar's record on civil liberties and his network's connections to the NSA and Booz Allen Hamilton are enough to raise serious red flags about his new venture. As principal shareholder and chairman of eBay, Omidyar controls eBay's child company, PayPal. PayPal has recently made headlines for prosecuting the so-called PayPal 14, the hacktivists who staged a virtual sit-in in protest of PayPal's decision to cut off WikiLeaks funding by organizing a denial-of-service attack on PayPal's website. PayPal was co-founded by Max Levchin, a dedicated NSA supporter. So I can't speak for Silicon Valley because I actually have a slightly different view of 
of that specific issue largely having to do with my immigrant origins. I am probably uncharacteristically pro national security agencies writ large and NSA in particular, despite the fact that they would not hire me at some point. I actually wanted to work for the NSA and I was not a US citizen and that sort of ended right there. Mm-hmm. But I really value my privacy and I really value the government not knowing more than they absolutely must about me. But I also fundamentally believe that this country in particular so far has its citizenry's interests in mind that I just fundamentally trust the national security establishment to care about the citizens, to spy on the things that need spying. More worrying still, Sal Gambianco, one of the principal investment partners with the Omidyar Network, actually sits on the board of advisors of Globant, a software company in which the Omidyar Network and Booz Allen Hamilton, Snowden's former employer, are major shareholders. Philip Odin, one of the Booz Allen Hamilton board members, also sits on the board of directors of Globant. The Omidyar Network and Booz Allen Hamilton are also both major investors in Innocentive. Yet somehow none of these concerns are enough for Greenwald's most ardent supporters to even raise the question of how he is using his personal collection of leaked NSA files and who he is getting into bed with financially to do so. One truly independent media figure who has raised this question publicly in recent days is Sibel Edmonds of BoilingFrogsPost.com. In a recent series of articles, she has been reporting on the Greenwald, Omidyar, PayPal, NSA connection, and has exclusively reported that a retired NSA source is claiming that PayPal involvement in the NSA is explicitly mentioned in some of the documents that Greenwald has yet to share with the public. Greenwald has issued denials to the effect that he has not encountered any such information in the leaks, but has stated that he has no doubt that PayPal has a relationship with the NSA. However, to those presuming to ask questions about the possible conflict of interest of the lead NSA leak reporter teaming up with a man whose personal financial empire rests on a company that undoubtedly has a relationship with the NSA, Greenwald is surprisingly quick to issue ad hominem attacks and surprisingly slow to issue a substantive refutation of the concern. Now, a number of whistleblowers and journalists are lining up to voice their own concerns about the fact that the only two people in the world with access to the full treasure trove of Snowden documents Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, are joining forces with billionaire Pierre Omidyar. So here we have, uh, for, you know, the, the marketing campaign for First Look or, uh, about First Amendment and adversarial journalism and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, today it costs relatively little to publish. If you look at the networked fourth estate, for example, that, that Bankler talked about in the Manning trial, the... Um, the combination of both pro amateur, um, you know, serious um, journalists as well as nonprofits, as well as organizations like WikiLeaks and then larger media organizations, they all work in an, an ecosystem. If you look at the value of Manning's leaks, for example, it drove the cost down for Jeremy Scahill's book, Dirty Wars. So, what Pierre's has essentially done, you know, we're talking about a theoretical structure here, by uh, blockading WikiLeaks, MasterCard, PayPal, and Visa have driven the cost up of publication that is naturally, essentially free to distribute on the internet. Um, so for me, the issue of a free press is not, you know, uh, how, how big is the, how many billionaires do I have funding my journalism? It's, do I have the capacity to raise funds if I get li- um, brought up on charges for publishing suppressed information or all the other costs that come along with doing national security reporting and the like. So once again, you know, when uh, he responded to the question on the PayPal blockade, he was evasive. He, you know, tried to pawn it off on WikiLeaks, who is his competition, incidentally, uh, no matter how, which way you slice it. And that's competition is natural and fine. I'm just saying, well, let's like call a spade a spade right. um, and tried to say it was like WikiLeaks confusion. Well, it was... WikiLeaks confusion, it was the internet's confusion, it was Glenn Greenwald's confusion, it was the Freedom of the Press Organization's confusion. So um, once again, I think that what that revealed to me is that uh, by his own words and actions in response to those two issues, that I don't trust him. Well, uh, uh, these kind of things are actually apropos. I think we, uh, celebrities have to take harsh criticism. It can't be uh, all adoration or, or loathing, but I think that um, 
uh, Sabelle has published a good critical article. Uh, we put up another one that uh, that it needs more research and more coverage in order that uh, the story not go completely off the chart into um, win or lose. I think there's a lot of nuance involved here, and uh, I think the nuance is helpful uh, because uh, it's hard to come by. And so I think that uh, Sabelle did a great piece, and I think we'll see more of that. At one point, uh, Greenwald did great pieces of criticizing uh, celebrity politicians and others. Uh, and so I think he's quite familiar with what this is about. Unfortunately, he's gotten in a bad habit of lashing back at this almost in a petulant kind of way. But then celebrities do that. Or either that or their agents tell them to do that because it pleases their fans. And Twitter, of course, is perfect for that lash back. Mm. But uh, eventually, I think he will uh, overcome that and stop um, uh, demeaning himself by being petulant. But it takes a while to, to develop the scar tissue required to not uh, be bothered by these seeming first glance as though they're personal attacks. But actually, I, uh, Sabelle's stuff went well below the surface, and it's long overdue, and I, th- I hope others will, 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 will emulate that. Of course, she's been heavily attacked for writing this article. Again, those who are pushing for a black and white approach to this, um, you know, are actually quite destructive. And so that also is a warning shot uh, to others who might dare challenge this kind of celebrity thing is that the fans go berserk. Now, so Amidyar's network, uh, Omidyar owns um, PayPal. He purchased PayPal through eBay in 2002. And um, there are a lot of executives that, uh, uh, young executives that ran PayPal at the time and, um, and became kind of the leaders in this, uh, in, the, in the commercial side of the NSA spy, spying, really. Um, one of them uh, being Peter Thiel, who is uh, a PayPal co-founder and who, along with a man named Alex Karp, um, created this company called Palantir which is, uh, I would say, primarily the, the, it's the major company behind providing technology to the NSA for spying for domestic surveillance. And so these connections to these PayPal guys and, and the fact that Omidyar owns PayPal and is now essentially uh, funding the slow release of these NSA documents for, that were stolen by uh, Edward Snowden, all of this um, should lead people to... Uh, responsibly and but and carefully question what's really going on because you know if 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 the intent really was to provide documents uh that the American public needs to know about that that shows what the NSA is doing why can't they just do that instead of piecemeal frankly there's only 900 documents approximately that have been revealed out of a number that just keeps changing so there's a lot of questions about that Glenn Greenwald has repeatedly ignored requests for comment for this video report, but has posted a lengthy response to such charges on his website in a post entitled, Email Exchange with Reader Over First Look and NSA Reporting. In the post, Greenwald bizarrely claims that his critics are forgetting that Laura Poitras also has access to the full set of Snowden documents, without noting that she is also joining Omidyar's $250 million operation. When he does address the issue of the blatant conflicts of interests in the situation, he writes... Ultimately, in terms of conflict of interest, how is this different from working with any other media outlet? Salon has very rich funders. Do you think I suppressed stories that conflicted with their business interests? Democracy Now! is funded by lots of rich people. Do you think Amy Goodman conceals big stories that would undermine the business interests of her funders? Although clearly intended as a rhetorical question meant to make the foundation funding of sources like Democracy Now! seem to be unproblematic, This is in fact an issue that has been addressed many times by outlets like BoilingFrogsPost.com and other commentators who are unhappy with the reporting of the likes of Amy Goodman. In the end, of course, only time will tell if Greenwald courageously works to expose the NSA PayPal linkages via his new Omidyar-sponsored position. Unfortunately for us, if that reporting proceeds at the current pace, most of the people watching this video will be dead before such a day ever comes. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.